So, just a quick show of hands here. How many of you in this room are a, um, an owner slash operator of a data center? So, like count four, five. Uh, how many of you are a data center end user? Like end user as in like you use you rent space at a co-location. Uh, I got one. I have a business card for you. <laughs> <laughs> and how many in here use data centers overall somewhere in their value value chain? That should be everybody. <laughs> If you're not, your name's probably Fred Flintstone. <laughs> uh, so uh, data centers uh, today look a specific way. What we're talking about right now is what is it going to look like in 2030 or so. Now, uh, before we launch into that, I'm going to do a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, 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 so talk a little bit about CERC, uh, the Computing Infrastructure Research uh, Center, which is upstairs. Uh, and, and if you got the chance to take the tour today? Yeah. Cool. If you did not, uh, catch me after this, I will give you another one. Uh, so, uh, CERC has been upstairs for about three years now. We are Canada's only uh, uh, data center focused research facility. We are uh, one about uh, three or so in the world. So, kind of unique facilities. It's, uh, we have a lab which is a data center. Uh, so. You can do experiments on configurations of mission critical facilities in a non-mission critical environment, which is not easy to have. Uh, uh, we, the way we work is also kind of unique. Uh, we work in collaboration with uh, the private sector in ways uh, that would help drive innovation and build new products so as to move the industry forward. Uh, and that's something uh, McMaster's uh, well known for doing. So we have here uh, Dr. John Preston who's sitting over there, uh, who's, uh, if you want to talk more about McMaster's uh, uh, contributions to uh, doing industrial collaborations, he can probably talk about 12 hours on that. Do I go? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so that being said, uh, for the rest of the presentation, there's a warning. Uh, I'm trying to predict the future here. This is the data center of 2030. So, uh, take what I say with a grain of salt. Uh, don't hold me to it. This is, again, predicting the future. Um, okay, uh, now the, with that out of the way, uh, let's take a look at this diagram. I'm going to let it sink in for a second. What do we see here? This, uh, the way I like to look at it, is how the internet has, been, has evolved as uh, a metric, uh, not a metric, as, as, uh, as, as uh, with, with the progression of time. So I don't have a laser point. I guess I could use my mouse point. Well, I'll try to point with my finger, uh, organic pointer. Uh, so if you uh, start from the lower left end of the spectrum, the most archaic applications of networks of computers was messaging the World Wide Web, message boards, etc. they have a big latency tolerance. Like, nobody here really cares if you take ten, 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 10 seconds to receive an email or receive an update in a message board. But as you move further and further towards the upper right corner, you see our bandwidth tolerance for applications is going up, and our latency tolerance for applications are going down. All the way to this is roughly what 5G has promised us, a latency of one millisecond and a bandwidth which is, uh, so uh, the, a 5 gig bandwidth is not so much of a challenge, the latency is what's going to hold a lot of people back. So most of the 5G networks that are being implemented right now, they're, they're being labeled as 5G evolution because they don't really bring the latency into the picture yet. They're more dealing with the, dealing with the bandwidth. But, even beyond that, so if you look beyond that, there are some applications out there right now that have latency tolerances less than one millisecond. That's what's going to be required to power the internet of the future. Uh, so, to summarize, uh, I like to summarize things, make things simple because uh, I don't like thinking too much. We, uh, what 
would the future of the internet look like? It's going to have to support things in a way that we can have more for less money. So we want more compute and we want it faster. Uh, very standard human characteristic. We're getting more and more greedy every day. So we want more of compute and we want it faster. So we want to have to reduce the cost of compute, the overall cost of compute, the overall cost of building and operating a data center. And we have to keep, uh, put a data center closer to us so that the latency in me issuing a command to the data center and receiving a response back is as small as possible. Now, let's look at the cost aspect first. Uh, so this I stole from a Cisco white paper, which does a very good job at uh, looking at uh, over a, uh, a 10 year period, what is the total cost for a data center? Now, if you uh, look at the right hand side, the red, uh, like the biggest chunk of the pie, more than half, is actually the cost of servers. Uh, the energy cost that a lot of people uh, talk about, that's actually less than 19%, or, so less than 20% of the pie. Um, can we make this, so the lowest, intuitively the lowest hanging fruit to make compute cheaper, would we do make servers either cheaper themselves or better at crunching numbers? And this is where we've uh, had a few sessions today talking about GPUs, uh, application specific ICs, uh, FPGAs, etc. cetera. Uh, this is again uh, a very cool study that kind of compares uh, a CPU versus GPU, what is the capital cost? Uh, and this is measured in uh, dollars per flop or dollars per gigaflop over here. Uh, you can see that having G one GPU per CPU in your computing mix almost makes your capital cost for a server, uh, like reduces it by 75% or more. So we can probably make a projection from here. As we go into the future, general purpose CPUs are probably going to be used less and less. And things like G, uh, uh, GPUs that offer some parallelization, things like uh, more application-specific uh, 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 ICs or uh, FPGAs that offer more bang for your buck are going to be used more and more. And we're seeing that right now. You've heard from a couple people today, keep uh, hearing about this throughout this conference. Uh, um, so. The other thing that was in the mix, and people talk about this a lot, and uh, we have already had heard about this from two of the sessions today, is uh, cooling. Uh, now, we all know, and uh, my uh, buddy Amit over here would uh, talk about this uh, as soon as I'm done, is uh, liquid cooling is cheaper. He has a very good example where he shows that a glass of water, like this, has the same cooling capacity as, what was that, a room full of air or something it's, like that? Uh, 3,661 more thermal connectivity than uh, air. So basically this water can cool better than what essentially this room, uh, this room full of air can do. Uh, now, the biggest barrier is a misconception about liquid cooling, that liquid cooling is very expensive to install. Yes, in circumstances, especially if you're doing retrofits, but in, uh, this is a very ideal study that was done, but in ideal cases, so what is an ideal situation today would become the standard norm five years from now, 10 years now from now. Liquid cooling is uh, turning out to be cheaper overall in capital expenses. And so uh, I saw one of the best implementations of this in a uh, 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 data center that I visited in San Diego, Chris, who's uh, uh, sitting right up front over here. Uh, so when you think of co-location, you think of uh, race floor, uh, crack gallery, blasting air. They did it completely differently. They have custom designed racks with water that flows into the racks. And that's the only way you can support future computing density. So I was amazed to see actually that they have uh, intelligent control uh, in those uh, cooling systems. Uh, so you'll uh, hear, be hearing from him in the panel that starts right after, as soon as I stop yapping, but that's going to be a lot more. I don't see any coffee cups. You might need some coffee. Okay. Uh, since we're talking about energy, let's look at this. Where does the energy go in a data center? The most 
So in that pie chart that I showed, I think three slides back, the biggest part of the OPEX in there was the energy cost. Where does that energy go? Uh, this is a US EPA study, I believe, uh, from uh, about uh, six or seven years ago, which shows in a typical data center, one of the biggest uh, drains of energy is the cooling part. So over here, you can see chiller, air handler, this, so you sum this 33 and five and a half, so roughly 40 kilowatts out of 100 kilowatt that's used in the data center would be going towards power and cooling. This is where being intelligent and having liquid cooling can cut costs. Uh, so uh, another example, this is a product propaganda from a Russian company, uh, but they're quite accurate about it. They look at this particular, so I'm referring to the top portion over here. Uh, they look at the uh, standard 10 megawatt da data center where uh, uh, I think the name of this company is RSC Cooling or something like that. Uh, and very ideal uh, calculations under very ideal conditions, but at, uh, what the standard 10 megawatt data center might do with uh, direct to chip liquid cooling, which is the product that I'm showing over there, uh, uh, gives you about, uh, uh, you can do the same amount of compute with about six and a half or so megawatts. Uh, the table below is even more interesting. This is, I've cobbled this data from a bunch of white papers. A large chunk of it uh, comes from one that uh, uh, was published by Rital a few years ago. And uh, then I did some calculations to come up with a cost per year, assuming, I think I assumed uh, 10 cents a kilowatt hour for energy or so. And so this shows you uh, the various different technologies out there in the market right now for cooling. And what, so how many kilowatts per ton of refrigeration is required for uh, cooling using these technologies? And the energy consumed, but in more tangible terms. I look at cost for a year to do that cooling at the rate of 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so uh, starting from the top, which is crack, cool, no container, the, the worst case situation you can have for cooling, all the way to the bottom. Now, the absolute bottom immersion cooling, again, that's ideal conditions. I don't think that's even realizable. But just by doing standard uh, rear door heating, basically bringing the refrigeration or the cooling part, water, as close as possible to the heat source, which is essentially CPU, GPUs, etc., you save more and more energy. Uh, very good implementation in the scale made with data centers I've, uh, I've uh, witnessed. Excellent, excellent uh, implementation in um, anybody out there who's implementing direct to chip, although direct to chip is not mainstream right now, mainly because of uh, manufacturing constraints, not because of anything uh, wrong in the industry. Uh, 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 but just look at how drastically your energy consumption goes down from being, so from spending about uh, one and a half million dollars a year on energy, just going to uh, liquid cooled rear doors, you're uh, coming down to half a million dollars. So you're cutting down your cost by two thirds. Speaking of OPEX, you know how I was talking about CPU versus GPU costs per flop in um, uh, uh, like uh, in, uh, in the actual price of the chips for doing compute. Turns out there's also an energy benefit of using GPUs over CPUs uh, for doing certain kinds of competition. Now there's again a caveat here. The GPUs can only be used uh, to do certain kinds of computation, which uh, our colleague Ian, uh, who had the session prior to this, was talking about. But if you can efficiently use GPUs, this is uh, so. This is a comparison of uh, the Intel Xeons, which is the pink. Pointers versus the blue pointers are the, I believe the NVIDIA Teslas from 2012. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the GPU burns about a quarter, I would say, the energy of that of a uh, CPU for doing the same calculations. Uh, and this is for double precision. So if you do single precision, I think the ratio is way, way more. So again, if you want to make compute cheaper, you have to have GPUs or more application specific ICs that are liquid cooled. So two points so far. Okay, let's target a third way to uh, make compute cheaper. Packing things closer together. So 
the picture here with the pink cables coming out and neatly organized, it's very rare to see a data center this well organized, but this was a publication from Google that came out, uh, I believe, the middle of last year. Uh, it's, uh, they call it their, uh, the TPU or something like that. I think it's a, a, ten, it's a tensor processing unit. I think it's specifically designed for doing tensor flow type workloads, so uh, machine learning, deep learning, and so on and so forth. Uh, they pack a lot of servers together. Now, they don't really publish what the total wattage is, but if you look at the top, now this is how I kind of cheated. If you look at the top, those are LTEC uh, rectifiers that are, I think, uh, about four and a half kilowatts each. And if you count the number, these come, come out to be about 45 kilo, 50 kilowatts per rack. So whenever you have to do a lot of number crunching, it's better to pack them together. Now, a uh, common misconception in the industry is high density is high cost. Uh, this particular graph over here, which I guess I got from a uh, white paper by Burdiff kind of shows something to the contrary. And this is, under simplifying assumptions, this does not take real estate costs into the calculation. This is purely from other things, like the cost of copper, the cost of uh, uh, racks, and other kinds of metal. It shows you that by going from 2.5 kilowatts a rack to 10 kilowatts a rack, you have now slashed your cost per kilowatt from about 25,000 dollars to build to less than 5,000. Now, is there anyone out there still operating 2.5 kilowatts per rack? 5 kilowatts? 10 kilowatts? 10 kilowatts is actually considered high density in most industries. Uh, uh, anyone from an HPC background that's around would tell you 10 kilowatts per rack is low density because uh, but and they have a whole different need. Uh, so when you go from 10 kilowatts a rack to uh, uh, 40 kilowatts a rack, this doesn't quite scale as well, but it gets cheaper and cheaper as you go higher and higher. Um, okay, uh, so the next thing, let's talk a little bit about, so we were talking about saving costs purely from hardware. This is another example of saving costs and energy. Uh, so uh, this particular example, this is a work that uh, we did upstairs. My crew, the people who did this work are in the room right now. Where are you going to go? Oh, right there. And uh, Doug is somewhere around too, or, or maybe not. Uh, uh, so this basically is an algorithm that we developed that uh, in real time figures out which piece of equipment does a particular job uh, better or more energy efficiently and distributes workload from an incoming pool that way. And we show in this particular, again, ideal experiment, so realization would probably take five years, but using algorithms like this, distributing workload intelligently gives you like a, uh, an energy benefit, 20 to 30 percent. This is just shifting workload around. I'm not doing anything other than using a piece of software that understands which pieces of my equipment do better in terms of the energy cost of doing computation and shifts them around. Did I get that right, Kata? Awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, another piece of, well, uh, another way, uh, that, again, this was a point this, uh, that was brought up earlier today is uh, how do we reduce costs? Maybe by reducing redundancies. Uh, a lot of people feel nervous about that because we use redundancies because we want to be more fault tolerant. But this is an active area of research right now. And again, uh, Fernando uh, is uh, somewhere out there lurking. Uh, and data over there will tell you about this algorithm we have been training for a while, which kind of takes out the need for having redundancies. Not yet, this is still experimental. But instead of having a failover, what this system does is it gives you a heads up. Well, it is intended to give you a heads up like a month in advance that there's something wrong with the system. You better take a look right now. So you don't have to be paranoid about, or paranoid is a bad word, but you don't have to be always cautious and building like 2n redundancies, n plus 1, 2n, 2n plus 2, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, kind of takes, uh, uh, 
it's a whole new approach of doing things. But think about it. Uh, so this is stuff again for uh, the 2030 data center. When you have instead of having one, uh, like a small number of large data centers that are like megawatts, when you move to say tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of small data centers that are distributed, we can't really afford to have that many of redundant equipment out there. And that's when these, uh, uh, the, these technologies are gonna uh, uh, take, uh, uh, like get their uh, trial by fire and see how they do in the industry. Uh, this particular picture kinda explains uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk about. Uh, does anyone in the room not know what Amazon Dash is? So it's basically this button. I don't think anyone would. Uh, uh, so who in the room uses Amazon Dash? Do you like it? <laughs> I got it from my parents. Do you have it in the washroom by the toilet? Okay. <laughs> is that a little bit funny? But uh, uh, the thing is. Again, why do we need the edge? Like I was talking about earlier, it's all about latency. So there's a bandwidth cap, bandwidth cap is what's driving the edge right now. But I think in 10 years uh, or uh, even sooner, the latency tolerances for our applications would require more and more compute towards the edge. We can't wait for two days for Amazon Prime or one day for Amazon Prime or two hours now for Amazon Prime to show up. Even two hours is too much when you're in that situation. So, we can't have a compute located in Los Angeles serve applications to the left of the 10 millisecond band using a server that's uh, located in, say, New York City. Or, like, look at the data. These, I, I did these uh, numbers a few months back. This is uh, what the standard uh, round trip latency is from. Uh, uh, these various cities. Obviously, Auckland is in a different planet, uh, and we don't want to worry about that. <laughs> but uh, if you look at like uh, even well, the rest of the cities up there are in this continent. Uh, so having a data center in Toronto, I can't serve many of these applications on this diagram over here using a data center in Toronto to serve customers or app uh, applications in say Los Angeles or even Vancouver. Uh, and uh, uh, to uh, take this even further, if you look at the speed of light, actually last time I gave this talk, someone pointed out I have a calculation error in that uh, 2.6 milliseconds, so it, it might be 26 or 0.26, I don't know for sure, but uh, the point is, even if there were... <laughs> I'm clumsy, everybody knows that, especially my colleagues here. <laughs> Uh, so even if there was no latencies associated with networking, switching, routing, com the actual compute part, and if I had a perfect server that as soon as it received a command was able to uh, compute a response and send it back, uh, the a round trip between New York City and Los Angeles by the speed of light is about two and a half milliseconds. So anything that's 5G grade and above cannot be supported unless you have compute closer to your applications. So, uh, the edge is real, that was my point. I don't know why I spent so much time <laughs> explaining that. Uh, so, how does this edge look like in the future? Uh, think about it, right now we are in the core model. Uh, we have a small number of large data centers. The real fault tolerant data centers, we have to have lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, redundancies built in to uh, uh, have them uh, uh, make them fault tolerant. Uh, we have 24 7 staffing to make sure we're going to pick up if anything's going wrong. In the future, we would have to automate that because when instead of having, say, say uh, having only one data center with, say, 100,000 servers, we now go to 100,000 data centers having one server each. You can't have 24 7 staffing at all of them. So, uh, how do we tackle that? So. Uh, we have to automate several functions, and uh, one of the main things is taking out manual intervention <coughs> or having a facilities guy there all the time to take care or, uh, of uh, things, having people there doing regular maintenance, regular audits, etc. 
And we've been working a fair bit among, about this too. So Muhammad is sitting right there and staring at his phone and not paying attention. Uh, could tell you if you uh, uh, get to him during uh, uh, the next break about uh, using unsupervised learning methods to look at anomalies in data streams collected in real time from various points within a functioning data center. Uh, and correlating them the, with uh, faults and failures and predictors of faults and failures. So he can tell you if something's vibrating funny that it's going to lead to a failure that's coming very soon. Well, I think uh, I've run out of time a long time ago. So let's just make a summary of, uh, of all the things that I was talking about. What would the various uh, what I think, again, uh, from the uh, con content advisory that I had in slide number two, don't take this seriously, but what would the data center look like in 2030? Uh, so uh, the first point is we're probably going to have small, a large number of small data. This is still going to be the cloud. The cloud is going to be our workhorse, but uh, uh, what we're going to need that's new is small, a large number of small one, two, three rack data centers that are everywhere around every street corner. They will have various different computing types of computing equipment, not the standard commodity server, but uh, IC or chips that are better suited to the applications. Uh, so some of them would have a combination of GPUs and FPGAs. Some of them will have other kinds of ASICs. Some of them will have ASICs that are specific for uh, blockchain applications. Some of them will have ASICs that are specific to something else. I don't even know what those applications are going to be. Uh, but, uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of different types of uh, equipment installed there. Uh, we're probably going to move into soon fault tolerant parallel liquid cooling subsystems, which can identify faults within them, not the kind of uh, redundancy that we use right now, n plus 1, 2n, 2n plus 1, etc. Uh, we're going to have uh, some kind of intelligence in how workload gets shifted around. Uh, to save costs with increased resiliency and to uh, uh, support uh, what we are starting to call roaming applications. So a roaming application is that one that moves from place to place based on how a user moves or a device moves. Uh, we're definitely going towards high density compute. Uh, 100 kilowatts is a far shot. I don't know if that's an actual number. Uh, uh, that we're going to hit. There are examples of 100 kilowatt racks already, by the way, but uh, there's not a lot of examples out there right now. Um, uh, so, the, and then uh, there's elements of software control, like having single pin of glass control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's uh, basically it. My prediction for 2030. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.